Hello everyone and welcome back. My name is Mr. Cobalt and in this video we're going to be going over Raoult's law and how it's applied to find the partial pressures of different substances or different solutions. So let's get into this. Okay, so what we're going to start with is the question. Which of the following will have the lowest and which will have the highest total vapor pressure at 25 degrees Celsius? So uh, the key word here is total vapor pressure. That's going to be important to keep in mind. And I'll get to that in a moment. <clears throat> so first thing we want to do is look at the substances that they're giving us. So we have pure water. We have a solution of sucrose in water with a mole ratio of 0 0.01. So this is our Greek symbol chi. This stands for the mole ratio. Um, then we have a solution of KCl, an ionic substance that will dissociate in water. And this has a uh, mole ratio of 0 0.01 again. And we have finally a solution of methanol in water with a chi uh, mole ratio of 0 0.2. And they're giving us the vapor pressure of pure methanol is 143 torr at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's start with pure water. So pure water, um, Raoult's law, well, let's start with Raoult's law first. So Raoult's law tells us that uh, is a way of finding the pressure of a solution, something that has uh, something dissolved in it, right? So a solution is a basically a mixture. It's a homogeneous mixture. Solution is just another word or name for homogeneous mixture. So you can find the vapor pressure of water vapor, right? So remember the vapor pressure is the pressure due to the uh, substance uh, that is evaporating in a closed container at a certain temperature. So once equilibrium is reached where the number of particles coming out of solution versus the number of particles going into solution is equal, those rates are equal, the pressure you have at that equilibrium is called the vapor pressure. So that vapor pressure can change depending on what substances are dissolved in the water, right? So if you have pure water, there's no substances dissolved in the water, and so that is the vapor pressure of pure water at a particular temperature. But when you start putting substances into the water and dissolving substances in the water or mixing things with the water, well, those particles that you have introduced to the pure water are now going to be taking space, right? So if you have something dissolved in water, um, <clears throat> pure water uh, just it doesn't have anything on it. And when, you, when water evaporates, well, what particles are evaporating? the particles at the surface are the ones that are evaporating, right? So you have to be at the surface in order to evaporate and leave and into the gas phase, right? So if you are within the water, well, you can't evaporate because you're, you're within the water, you're surrounded by water molecules, you're not, you don't have access or you don't have, um, I should say, access to the air, if you will, right? So, but those molecules that are at the surface well, they can uh, release themselves. So if they have enough energy, they can overcome the attractive forces of the other water molecules and then be released into the air. So then they can become, the, they can go into the vapor phase. So you know, liquid to vapor phase, but that can only happen at the surface of the water. Well, why is this important? Uh, because when you dissolve substances in the water, well, now those are gonna be mixed in with the water. And so that space at the surface is going to be taken up to some degree by the other particles. So if those other particles take up the space at the surface of the water, well, that means fewer water molecules are going to be at that surface and therefore less likely to evaporate. So you're going to lower the vapor pressure by uh, dissolving things in the water, mainly because you have, you're taking up space at the surface more other particles that are taking up that space means less water particles can take up that space and therefore evaporate and become vapor. So we would expect that by dissolving something in the water, the vapor pressure of the water would decrease. And that's what we see. And that's what Raoult's law 
shows us, right? So we can actually calculate the numbers using this equation. So since we have pure water, well, there's nothing mixed in the water. We can just look up what the, uh, what the vapor pressure is uh, for water because we need to, in order to find the vapor pressure of the solution, you need to take the vapor pressure of pure water and multiply that by the mole fraction of the solution, the mole fraction of water. And just to remind you what we mean by the mole fraction of water, right? How do you calculate the mole fraction? The mole fraction is basically just a fraction of the substance you're interested in, the moles of the substance you're interested in, divided by the total moles in the solution. So the substance solute plus solvent. Right. So in this case, we're interested in the mole fraction of water. So we want the moles of water divided by the moles of water plus anything that's dissolved in the water. So moles of, we'll say, A plus moles of B plus dot, dot, dot. So anything else that's dissolved in the water. So this would be the total number of moles. So the mole fraction is the moles of water. So since we're interested in the mole fraction of water, it would be moles of water over the total moles of everything in the solution, right? So if we were interested in the mole fraction of A, this is the mole fraction of water, right? If it was the mole fraction of A that we were interested in, then we would put mole fraction of A is equal to the moles of A plus the total moles, which is moles of water plus A plus B and so on. But for Raoult's law, we're interested in the mole fraction of water because we're going to calculate the, uh, the partial pressure of water for a particular solution. So since we are starting with pure water, uh, we can just look up what the uh, mole race, I'm sorry, what the vapor pressure of water at that particular temperature, you look it up on a table. And so we look it up at 25 degrees Celsius and we find that it's 23.8 torr. So the vapor pressure of water, so the vapor pressure is going to be of the solution, right? The vapor pressure of water of the solution is going to be equal to 23 0.8 torr. So that's for pure water. You just look it up and that's, and we're going to compare the rest of that with the pure water. So let's uh, calculate what about sucrose solution. So we have the mole fraction they give us. We use Raoult's law. Let me erase this. So for Raoult's law, again, we want to know what the vapor pressure of water for this solution is. So we take the mole fraction, we multiply it by the vapor pressure of pure water, which is what we have here. And so let's calculate that. So the vapor pressure of water of the solution, right, is going to be equal to the vapor, uh, the mole, uh, the mole, ra mole ratio that they give us, which is 0 0.01. So 0 0.01 multiplied by the vapor pressure of pure water, which is 23.8 torr. Oops. And then I just multiply that in my calculator. And what I get is, give me a moment while I calculate that. Actually, I don't need to calculate that. I, well, I don't need to calculate. So if you need to calculate, just multiply. But since we're multiplied by 100, then we're just going to move over the decimal point twice. So that's going to be equal to 0 0.238 torr. So that is the vapor pressure at that solution, right? So we can write that down here. So the vapor pressure 
of the solution is going to be equal to 0 0.238 tor. And if we go to the next one, okay. So next we have a solution of KCL. Now here I want to point out with the sucrose, with the sucrose and the KCL, we have uh, a non-volatile substance. So here we have sucrose, sucrose is sugar. So the particles are going to dissolve in water. The sucrose is not going to break apart into any more particles. It's not going to dissociate into atoms and things like that. So this is going to be a, a one to one ratio when you dissolve this in water. Um, so uh, so uh, it's not the same with KCL though. And so what do I mean by, uh, I said earlier, these are non-volatile. It means that these are not going to evaporate and create uh, their own partial pressures. So KCL is not going to evaporate and then uh, create a partial pressure of KCL. And sucrose is not going to evaporate and cause a partial pressure of, of, uh, of, of sucrose, right? So that's why it's important to pay attention to that. They're asking for the total vapor pressure, right? So if we have two things mixed together that were both volatile, meaning they both evaporate, then you have to take into consideration both of those together. But um, since sucrose and uh, potassium chloride are not volatile, they're not going to evaporate. Um, so therefore, they're going to stay in the solution. So we don't have to worry about that. However, we do have to look at whether or not they are going to produce any more particles when they dissolve in water. So that's what I was mentioning before with the sucrose. So the sucrose, uh, when you dissolve sugar in water, uh, the sugar molecules just separate from each other and then they get surrounded by water and then they dissolve in the water. However, with KCL, it's not like you have KCL particles that stick together and then they dissolve and those KCL particles are floating around in the water, dissolved in the water because this is an ionic compound. And when this dissolves in water, the ions split apart. And so remember, when it comes to vapor pressure or uh, temperature lowering or, or, uh, or boil, lowering or boiling, pre, boiling point, melting point, things like that. All of those colligative properties, those are called colligative properties. All of those properties depend not on the identity of the substance that you're dissolving, but on the sheer number of particles that are in solution. That's why we're dealing with a mole ratio. So the mole ratio is a fraction or as a comparison of how many particles do you have of the substance you're interested in, in this case, water, versus the total number of particles we have in solution. So here, um, <clears throat> the different substances that you dissolve, the more particles they create, uh, the lower the mole ratio or the mole, uh, the mole fraction that you're going to have. Okay, so in this case, since we have KCL and we're given the mole fraction, they're giving us a mole fraction of 0 0.01. Now, there's a couple of things about the mole fraction uh, that we need to ask ourselves for this problem. There's some ambiguities in this problem. I'll talk more about it towards the end of the video. But one is the mole fraction that they're giving us. Is this the mole fraction of water? Or is this the mole fraction of the solute, right? Is this the, so they don't really indicate what the mole fraction is they're giving us. Uh, so is it the solvent mole fraction or is it the solute mole, fra solute mole fraction? Um, I'll show in a moment that it doesn't matter. Uh, I've been assuming that it's the mole fraction of water, uh, but we'll talk about that towards later. I'll show you that it doesn't really matter. And also at the end of the video, I'll show you how you didn't have to do any calculations to figure this out. So stay tuned. Oh, and if you haven't done so already, make sure you like, share, and subscribe my video and subscribe to my channel. It'll help me out a lot. Okay, so what about KCL? So I know KCL will 
it, uh, dissolve in water and then it will uh, dissociate into two ions. So we have to take in consideration what the Van, uh, Van t Hoff factor is. So what is the Van Hoff factor? The Van Hoff factor is, that's going to be the moles, oops, that's going to be the moles of the substance that we're dissolving and then divided by the moles, the total moles of the, or, or I got it backwards. It's going to be the total moles of the particles in solution divided by the moles of the substance that you're given. And this is represented by the letter I. So small i. So that's the number of moles of particles divided by the number of moles of substance. So for example, if I dissolve two moles of KCl, that's the moles of the substance, right? That would be two. So I'd have a two moles down here. And then I know that this is going to dissolve and dissociate into calcium, I'm sorry, potassium ions and chloride ions. So it's going to dissolve into two ions. So once one particle, I guess, or formula unit like substance is going to dissolve or dissociate into two ions. So the number of particles doubles. So the number of moles of the actual particles that come from two moles of the KCl doubles and I get four, right? Or another way to put it is for every one of these that I put in water, right? So for every one mole I put in water, I get two particles or two moles. So the Van Hoff factor for KCl is going to be two because two over one is two. So I have to take that in consideration. So when I do my, when they give us this, the question is, is this the, uh, does this take in consideration the Van Hoff factor for uh, KCl? And so it doesn't look like it does. Uh, they're giving us the same mole fraction. So if this did include the uh, Van Hoff factor, then we would end up with the exact same answer here, right? Which is probably not what they want. So if we are going to include the Van Hoff factor for KCL, then we would have to divide this by two because we have double the amount of KCL or particles, I should say, from KCl uh, in solution. So we have to double, uh, we have to uh, divide by two, right? So just to clear, make that clear. So again, remember, our mole fraction is equal to the moles of water divided by, oops, the moles of water plus the moles of our solute. But notice that the moles of solute that we're given is going to be uh, doubled due to our Van Hoff factor of two. So it would be this number times two. So we would have to multiply that number by two. So that's how that works. So that means that whatever the Van Hoff factor is, it's going to be on in the denominator. And so you end up dividing. Oops. Let me bring this over so I have more room. So there's the 
my ugly looking Kai water, and that's moles of water. over moles of, oops, sorry about that, so I have moles of water plus, and then I'm going to have moles of whatever the solute is, A times 2, and that's going to be in the denominator, so you can see that Whatever the Van Hoff factor is, if the Van Hoff factor is one, meaning that for every substance or particle substance you get, you only get one particle dissolved in water. That's what we have with sucrose, right? So for every sucrose molecule you put into water, it's not going to break apart. It's just going to be one sucrose molecule. And so this would be a one. And so that would not affect the... Uh, Mole, mole, uh, the mole ratio here, or the uh, uh, mole, uh, the chi squared here, or chi here. Um, but since we have a factor, a Van Hoff factor of two here, um, anything that's two or greater is going to make the uh, mole ratio here uh, smaller. So that's going to make. Uh, this number smaller here. So since we don't know what the original moles are, all we're given is this, then we know that the Van Hoff factor is uh, going to make this uh, smaller. And so what we can see here is that if what I'm saying is true about, the, if we're assuming that the uh, mole ratio here uh, is uh, the the mole fraction of the uh, of the water, not the solute? Um, then what you'll see is that the vapor pressure of this water is decreasing with uh, the increasing amount of particles. So here we have pure water, twenty three point eight. Here we have the uh, vapor pressure of sucrose uh, solution, and it's less than that. And with the fact that we have a Van Hoff factor of two, that's going to make this uh, mole fraction uh, even smaller. That's going to lower the vapor pressure even more. And so that's if we assume that the, the uh, mole fraction here is uh, that of water, but if it's the if it's the mole fraction of the solute, we can do the same thing. So let's assume now that this is the mole fraction of the solute. Well, to get the mole fraction of water, remember for Van Hoff, the Van Hoff, I'm sorry, for Raoult's wall um, law, uh, we need the mole fraction of water. So in order to get the mole fraction of water, if you're given the mole fraction of the solute instead of the mole fraction of water, then you just subtract that from one because the two mole fractions together, right? The mole fractions of all of the substances that you have in the solution should add up to one. Just like all the percentages should add up to 100, we're not dealing with percentages, we're just dealing with the fractions. So all the fractions of all the substances in the solution should add up to one. If we've only got two substances, water plus whatever is dissolved in the water, then you add those two together, you should get one. Well, if you're given one mole fraction, then to get the other one, you just subtract that from one. So if we assume here that what we're given is the mole fraction of the solute, then you subtract that from one and you get the mole fraction of water. So here, you're given the mole fraction of the solute, assuming that we're, this is the mole fraction of solute, subtract that from one. So let's go ahead and do that. If you take that, so that uh, would equal, so we take one and we subtract 0 0.01, that's going to give us a, a mole fraction of water of 0 0.01. 9, 9.
Okay, so then we take that mole fraction and we multiply by the, uh, the partial pressure of water vapor at 25 degrees. So if we do that, we get, what do we get? We get 23.6. So here, the pressure of the solution is going to be equal to 23.6 torr. So again, you can see it's still less, right? 23.6 torr, 23.8. So the vapor pressure is decreasing. Actually, this makes more sense because we wouldn't expect the vapor pressure of water to de decrease so much. Um, so, um, so with that, we have, this is the uh, total, uh, the vapor pressure of water for that solution. And then here, again, if this is the, uh, the mole fraction of the solute, then for every mole that we dissolve of this, we get two moles of the particles. So it's a one to two ratio. So if this is the mole fraction of this whole thing, then to get the mole fraction of all the particles that are dissolved in the water, we would multiply that by two. So then if we multiply this by two, then we get 0 0.02 for the mole fraction of all the particles, the potassium ions plus the water plus the, the chloride ions all together, that should equal 0 0.02 for for this. Now, if we subtract that from one, we get, so take this, subtract that from one, and we get 0 0.98. And if we take that and multiply by 23.8, we get 23.3. So here we're going to put the partial pressure of the solution is equal to 23.3 torr. Okay, now what? Now for the last one. So a solution of methanol in water with a uh, mole fraction of 0 0.2. Now methanol is a volatile substance, so the methanol and the water will evaporate together. So methanol is going to add to the uh, vapor pressure, uh, the total vapor pressure. So we need to calculate the vapor pressure of the water and the vapor pressure of the uh, methanol and add those together. So let me erase this and Show you what we're going to do. So we're going to have to apply Raoult's law twice, once towards the solvent and once towards the solute, since the solute is also volatile. So that means that both are going to evaporate together and add to the total vapor pressure uh, at 25 degrees Celsius. So we're going to have to find the vapor pressure of water. And that's going to be equal to, oops, that's going to be equal to the mole fraction of water multiplied by the uh, vapor pressure of pure water. And then we're going to have to do the same thing for methanol. So the vapor pressure of methanol is going to be equal to the mole fraction of methanol, I'll just put meth, multiplied by the vapor pressure of pure methanol, or I'll just put M, I'll just put M for methanol. So if we assume that this is the mole fraction of methanol, and methanol is a uh, 
is just a molecule, so it's not it's not an ionic substance. It's not going to break up into parts, so we don't have to worry about the Van't Hoff factor. Um, but if we assume that this is the uh, mole fraction of the solute, methanol, then to get the mole fraction of water, we subtract that from one. So if we take this as, let's assume, if we assume that for part D, that the mole fraction of methanol is 0 0.2, then to get the mole fraction of water, that's going to be equal to 1 minus 0 0.2. So that's going to be 0 0.8. And if we take the, these and put them in our equation, so we do this one first. So this is 0 0.8, we're assuming. So 0 0.8 times 23.8. And then here, the mole fraction of methanol, we're assuming that's 0 0.2 because that's what they gave us here. So 0 0.2. And they gave us the vapor pressure of methanol is 143 uh, torr at 25 degrees. So 143 torr. This is tor as well, I'm just not writing it down. And when I calculate those, I get 19.0 tor for the water vapor, and for the methanol, I get 28.6. So 28.6 tor. And then to get the total, right, because we want the total vapor, so vapor pressure, so we're going to add up the partial pressures according to Dalton's law. Um, and so then 28.6 plus 19 gives me 47.6 torr. And so the question is asking us which one has the lowest vapor pressure. So if you look at this, then we'll see that C has the lowest vapor pressure, 23.3. And we'll see that D has the highest vapor pressure of 47.6. Now, last thing I want to cover before ending the video is that um, you actually didn't have to calculate any of this in order to figure out which has the highest and which has the lowest. So what you could see here is with regard to the different substances, <clears throat> right? You have pure water. So pure water is going to be whatever the uh, partial pressure is. You can call it X, you can call it A. Um, but you know that from the uh, chemistry behind it, that again, as you are putting more solute into your water, that's going to prevent more water molecules from evaporating. So you would expect the vapor pressure to go down as you're adding more and more substances, right? So with a, with this, you'd say, okay, well, if I'm adding sucrose at a certain mole fraction, then that's going to lower the vapor pressure from the pure, right? So anything you add to the pure water is going to lower the vapor pressure. So you know that in B, B is going to be lower than A, right? Whatever A is. You don't even need to know what A is. Now for C, Again, if you were paying attention to this being an ionic compound and therefore it's going to dissociate in water and then you have more particles in water, right? So even if you're given the same mole fraction, you know that equal amounts of these put into water, this is gonna have more particles in the water. And so you would expect that this is going to have a lower vapor pressure compared to sucrose, right? Because you have more particles uh, 
dissolved in water, even if you dissolve the same mole amount of sucrose and the KCL, you know you're going to end up with more particles when you dissolve KCL than when you dissolve sucrose, assuming they're dissolving the same amount. And so you know that KCL would give you an even lower vapor pressure compared to B. So B would be the lowest so far. Well, what about D? Well, if you look at D, uh, you can see that the chi value, the uh, mole fraction here, is much larger than these. And if we assume that's the mole fraction of the solute, they're giving us the 143 tor of the methanol. Now, you might do the calculation here, but uh, if you notice, this is a pretty large um, large value, right? So if you're taking a fifth of this, you could see from the calculation that it was already 28.6 tor without even factoring in the uh, the mole, uh, the uh, vapor pressure due to water, right? So if, uh, if you're uh, strapped for time, you could just kind of eyeball this and say, look, I have 143 tor. Um, this is a chi value of one half of, of one fifth, and then you could see that this is probably going to be a lot more vapor pressure uh, compared to the others. So, you know, when you're dealing with a time crunch, if this was on a, a test or something that was timed, then you know, if you're if you're stuck for time, then you don't actually have to do really calculations to figure out what the answers are, right? So. So that's a way of viewing this problem and being able to solve this problem using what you know about, you know, Raoult's law and how uh, dissolving substances into a solvent can affect the partial pressures of that solvent and why that is. So you can use your reasoning skills and determine without doing any calculations, what is going to be the answers to this question, but you can also do the calculations as well. I hope this video was helpful. I know it was a bit on the long side, but if you enjoyed this video, if this helped you out in any way, if you learned anything from this, from this video, then please, by all means, like the video, share the video, hit that like button somewhere over here, down on the bottom. I believe in you. You can find it. Click it. Also, make sure you subscribe to my channel. Hit that notification bell. When you hit that notification bell, Make sure you click all, by the way, the notification bell is up here. Um, hit, click all so you can be notified by all the videos I put out. And finally, put a comment down below in the comment section. Let me know what you think. Ask me questions. I would love to hear from you. If you have any questions that you need help with, if you have a problem you need to solve or a topic you would like me to cover, please put that down below. I would love to do that for you. Thanks for joining me and have a great day.